السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد I'd like to thank all of you for coming out and um, a, a couple of things about the introduction yeah I'm I am from the States but I, I moved to Sudan anyone here not familiar with Sudan okay for those who don't know uh, Sudan is the greatest country in the world that wasn't a joke that's where I'm from originally, so I've, uh, I've been living there for the last nine months, and it's uh, fantastic. Um, when the event is over, a lot of you will want to come up to me and ask me, how is Sudan? For some reason, the minute I mention Sudan, people always come up and ask me, how is Sudan? And I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. Like, I don't come and say, how is England? I don't come and ask you that. Uh, how is Sudan? And I will tell you now, in advance, to save you the time, it's great. It's great, okay? So, great. We got that out of the way. Second thing in the introduction, I think I'm going to ask Al-Maghrib to remove that, well, this whole black belt thing, and black belt and da'wah. And obviously, I never described myself like that. They, they put that there. Someone made that up and they put it up there, black belt and da'wah and so on. Obviously, it wouldn't be humble for me to, to refer to myself as a black belt and da'wah. If I were to mention, you know, to describe myself, I would say like a five degree black belt and da'wah, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, very good. You guys look very serious today, you know. Now, I, I understand what it is, like uh, American humor is not good enough for you guys, you uh, British, intelligent British people, you know. You like, uh, you know, satire and witty, you like puns, you know. <laughs> In America, you just do something dumb, ah, everyone's like, eh. <laughs> but for you guys, you need something more, more intelligent, I see, huh? Okay, very good, very good. Yeah, success is not something, success. It's interesting, um, I remember one time I was reading about uh, a, a neighborhood where there are a lot of successful people, it's an affluent neighborhood, you know, they're wealthy and they're successful, yeah? And then they were talking about the problems in this neighborhood. And people had psychological problems, you know, just about every household had someone that was going to uh, a, a shrink, a psychologist, uh, the children were doing drugs and, you know, pregnancies, all kinds of problems in these households. You know, the man's going to therapy, the marriage is falling apart, and the woman, you know, is going to the doctor as well, and all kinds of issues. But they describe that neighborhood where most successful people live. And do you see a problem with that? They don't sound very successful to me, do they? <laughs> sound like failures, utter failures. Children here and there, drugs, problems, and crimes, and and the marriage is falling apart, and everyone's, you know, at the psychiatrist on a different day of the week. They don't sound very successful. So if I have a big house and a nice car, that means I'm successful? Or is it a combination of things? And that's why we would like to go with the combination, not just one or the other, yeah? Because when you were mentioning the brother who didn't complete his A-levels, yeah, I mean, that's part of the... The, the combination and we want him to be successful religiously and we also want the brother to be successful in the dunya right and so a lot of times you get one or the other you get the kinds of parents who insist on material success only so if the child wants to dedicate some time to Islamic studies the mother comes and tells him son what are you doing don't become extreme okay now, first of all, who said the word extreme right now? Nobody said the word extreme. He's just going to the masjid a few days, you know, maybe a tahfidh class here or there, a halaqa here or there. But his mother comes and says, don't be extreme, okay? And don't go overboard in your religion, please. Just five, pray five times a day. And when Ramadan comes fast, and you know, when you get old, go for hajj. You know, well, this is now the bare minimum, yeah? She, she wants the bare minimum from the religion. It's interesting that you rarely find parents who want the bare minimum from the dunya. So you never find this conversation from a mother. She'll come to her son and son, he's studying all night, trying to get straight A's. She'll come to him and son, why are you studying all night? Go to sleep, beta, huh? Beta, just go to sleep. You don't have to work so hard. <laughs> you don't like my Urdu, akhi? <laughs> you speak Urdu? No. What are you laughing at then? <laughs> <laughs> Who speaks Urdu in here? Ya yeah, salam. Yeah. I, can sh I can show off my Urdu now. Kya aap chahte hain ke Urdu mein aur Angrezi mein bolo? 
I'm just kidding, I don't speak Urdu. <laughs> so, we're saying then, imagine the mother comes in, the boy's studying really hard, he wants to get straight A's, she comes in and she's like, what, what are you doing? And he says, stop, stop studying, just, just don't, be in, don't go overboard with studies. I just want you to get C's, C pluses, you know, barely get by, get your GED or what is it, your A levels or O levels, huh? And, and just that's it, don't, don't pursue college or anything like that. Get an entry level job at McDonald's, flip some hamburgers and that's it, don't go overboard. <laughs> you never get that kind of uh, advice, right? Because when it comes to the dunya, we want the maximum. We want the maximum. So the mother wants him to get the best grades and then to go to university and then get his master's degree, then get his PhD, then get a big house and get a good car. And with religion, a lot of times you find people that just want the bare minimum. Now that's one extreme. Then we have the other extreme, where people basically, they, you know, look, everything, all this stuff is going to go. Yeah? Even if you have a car, are you going to take your car with you to the Akhirah? No. Are you going to take your degree with you on the Day of Judgment? No. Is Allah going to ask you about your degree? What did you study in the dunya? No. So what is the importance of all this? Just a piece of paper. Many times you meet du'at who belittle what you do. Like, you know, I used to go to university and, uh, you know, some religious people would come and so, all years and years of your life you're wasting just for this piece of paper. Like, yes. <laughs> it just, it's not just a piece of paper. It's not like someone tore a comic book strip from the newspaper and said, hey. <laughs> it's not just that, yeah? So we're looking at keeping a good balance between the two. So we want the best of both worlds, inshallah. Yeah, and is there anything that says, and this is very important, especially for the young people in the audience, pay attention please. Is there anything that says, if because you're a super religious person, you can't have a nice car, for example, or you, can't, or you shouldn't have a nice home, you shouldn't have a degree. I just want the person who says yes to this question, I want to understand where did you get that from? Okay, where did you get that from? And so many of the Sahaba were, by our standards today, and by that, the standards back then, they were millionaires by today's standards. Millionaires, not very wealthy, but millionaires. Okay, Abu Bakr, during one period of his life, he was a millionaire by our standards. Uthman ibn Affan was a millionaire. Abdurrahman ibn Auf, millionaire. Okay, now with these millionaires, they, they just live in luxury and like, like today's millionaires, they live in luxury and that's it, everyone else w wishes they had their money. No, their millions helped Islam. Their millions helped Islam tremendously. During the Battle of Tabuk, and Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa needed people to donate. It was a fundraiser like we have fundraisers, where someone would get up, say who, who will give a, a thousand, who will give two thousand, like that. It was a similar fundraiser. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would get up and he'd say, Man yujahiz jayshu al-usra wa lahu al-jannah. Who will prepare the army of distress? You know, it was called the army of distress or difficulty. Because it was a very difficult time to go out. Extremely difficult. Who will prepare this army? And he will have, and to him will be al-jannah, paradise. So Uthman ibn Affan would get up. And he would donate a hundred camels. You understand how much money that is? You all know how much a camel costs. Of course you do, right? You know what the monthly payments are on a camel? <laughs> we don't know. But it's a lot of money. So he got up, he donated 100 camels. Now, not just 100 camels, he said, يعني, with the saddles, with the reins, the ropes, everything needed, they're ready to go. It's like giving you a car with the keys, tire pressure is good, oil, gas is in the, tr the, 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 the <coughs> tank, ready to go. So then he, then he sat down. So now he got glad tidings of paradise, right? Because the Prophet ﷺ promised him that. I don't think your local fundraiser can say that, can he? <laughs> Who will give 5,000 pounds and to him will be paradise? He will be like, who is this guy exactly? <laughs> but then the Prophet ﷺ one more time asked, Who will prepare the army of distress and, he will, and to him is paradise? And Uthman ibn, ibn Affan got up and he says, And I pledge another hundred, bi biha wa ahlasiha, ready to go. Then he sat down. Then the Prophet ﷺ asked again, and then Uthman got up again. And is narrated he got up seven times. In one narration, ten times. Ten times. Imagine getting paradise glad tidings more than ten times. Or seven times. You know. We'll accept half, right? You'll accept half, brothers. <laughs> half is good. <laughs> one brother say, just let me just let me just put my foot in, in paradise. And the other can be out there. At the gate, we just let's see what's going on here. Hey, look at those guys! <laughs> Good enough for me, he said. <laughs> so, what we're trying to say here is that there's nothing wrong with being financially successful, 
You know? <laughs> and a lot of times, at least in the da'wah in the United States, many times what the problem with it is that there's no money, especially in the old days. Now communities are growing and they understand responsibilities, things like that. But in the old days there was problems. How many times there were some phenomenal projects we just needed a righteous and successful, yani, dunya-wise, person like Uthman radiallahu to come and say, look, what do you need? 50,000 to distribute this material and to, and to advertise on radio, TV? Here it is. There we go. But no, brothers, we need this, we need that. What would you say if I told you a lot of du'a are like beggars? And for the most part, for the longest time, d people involved in da'wah are like beggars, always needing money, always asking, always begging, pleading. Is this something that people should beg for? But suppose these people were, you know, had a, you know, successful businesses or had good degrees. Is there any problem there? So I just want to make sure if any young people in the audience think that, well, oh, this is not going to count in the next life and so on. No, you can make it count in the next life. You can take whatever you want with you to the next life. Can you take your house with you to the next life? Who says yes? Who says no? Who doesn't know? Okay. And who's just not here at all? <laughs> can you take your house with you to the next life? Can you take your car with you to the next life? Okay, you can. I'm going to show you how. Okay. Just like if you want to take, uh, you know, well, you guys have British pounds. It's a respected currency. But suppose you guys had some flimsy... Uh, currency, right? And you want to take it to another country, you can't use it there unless you convert it into a currency that will work there. So I can take my laptop with me to the next life if I want to. I just have to convert it into a currency that will work there. What currency works in the next life? Hasanat, reward. So I can convert my laptop in a number of ways to, for, into reward, right? I can do good work with it. I can do da'wah work with it. I can donate it to the masjid. I can sell it and give the money here and there. You understand where we're going with this? So you can take things with you to the next life. Yeah? So you're, for the righteous Muslim, okay, the righteous young man, the righteous woman, when they are successful in this life, it inshallah naturally will translate into good things for the next life as well. Because we're not talking about some, you know, some punk loser, you know, celebrity who is a millionaire and he's just he's going to use his wealth to disobey Allah Azza wa Jal. We want the righteous people to be millionaires who will use their wealth properly for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Relief, bam, check comes out. Some project, ready. So we do want both successes in case anyone was confused. Be a righteous person and be successful in this life as well. And many times. Even because we have this thought, it's very predominant in our society, but because it's so predominant that we, we actually expect the Imam to have a broken up car, okay? To live in a busted up apartment. Uh, do you guys expect that? I hope it's, that's not the case in the UK. But in the US, for example, people want the Imam to drive a 1980s Camry. And it's always an 87 Camry. And it has holes in it from the rust, okay? And it smells that car. That's the Imam's car. I personally know an imam who bought a luxury car, luxury SUV. You call them SUVs here? Four, four by four, is that what you call them? Yeah. Fantastic. He had a four by four. And in, when he bought it, how, what, what kind of an imam drives a nice car? So you, what's happening here? We accept for everyone else to be respected and respectable, except for the guy who works for Allah. Oh, you're a doctor? Oh, no wonder. That explains the Mercedes. You're an engineer? Oh, that explains the Porsche. But you're an imam, and you're driving a nice car? I'm sorry, I'm confused here. Why? Because the one who works for Allah, he should you know, treat him like dirt, kick him all his, Who cares? He works for Allah, Azul, you kick him. Open the door, kick him out. Let him stand out in the cold, he works for Allah. The guy who works for Allah should be respected more than anybody else. But we want our imam to have a busted up car. So some people start to accuse that man of stealing from the masjid. Why? Because he has a nice car. Everyone else can have a nice car in the community. No one will accuse him of stealing. But the Imam? Ah, why does he have a nice car? Yeah. So the, what message are we send, sending our youth? Be a doctor, drive a Mercedes. Be an Imam, 1987 Camry. It's a good future for you. A young man looks at both cars like, I'll become a doctor, inshallah. I'll still be a good guy and pray, but I don't want to be like this guy. Yeah? So, another time, uh, one imam, he bought a car. It was a Mercedes, right? He's an imam, he's young, but he bought a Mercedes. One of the board members of the masjid comes to his house and sits with him and says, how could you buy a nice car? He actually said this to him. He said, you should be a role model and drive a busted up car. 
wait a minute, role model, I should drive a busted up car. Okay, when I had a busted up car, did you sell your car and drive a busted up car? No. How am I role model then? This is a very strange mentality. So where, yani, the guy who works for Allah, for Allah, kick him in the teeth, it doesn't matter. He works for Allah. <laughs> Look at it. He works for Allah. You work at McDonald's, they respect you more. You get injured working at McDonald's, they pay for you, they take care of you until you come back to it. You work, uh, you work for Allah, as in you fall from a ladder getting some da'wah books from the top shelf, they're like, Hafiz Abilullah, brother, carry his broken, mangled body outside, you know. <laughs> What's wrong with you, Akhi? Alright, so I hope we're all in agreement here. Yes? You serious people? We're all in agreement that we, we want the best of both worlds. So if you're a, a, an a up-and-coming religious brother, yes, get good, good, good grades, get A's, okay? Oh no, no, because I have a beard over three inches long, I'll just get C's, inshallah, because you know, this dunya. No, Habibi, get good grades, work hard, become successful in both, inshallah. But if you're religious and successful, inshallah, that money will be, trans will be used to take you into paradise, all right? Okay, so, Another point in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions those who are successful. In Surah Al-Mu'minun, we'll just pause with that a little bit, right? And so Allah Azza wa Jal says, A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Qad aflah al-mu'minun, al-ladheena hum fi salatihim khashi'un. It's interesting, it's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the believers have prospered, right? And then Allah begins by describing the believers. But there's something here, let's not skip it. The first thing, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describe the people who are successful. See, um, and a lot of times like when you start the tafsir of these, of these verses, you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the believers and the first description of the believers is that they are humbled and focused in their prayers and then we begin talking about being humbled and focused in your prayers. But there's something before that. First thing, Allah Azza wa described those who are successful. And the first description of people who are successful is that they are and what the pause means you say it. Naam? Believers. Yeah? Excellent. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Qad aflaha. Hayya al falah. Just like in the, in the adhan. Hayya al falah. Come to success. Qad aflaha. So successful are, and who are they? The believers. So that means the first description of people who are successful is that they're believers. And I think everyone in this room can agree to that. Because you're a believer. That's the first sign of success. Because the person who's not a believer, the one who does not believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he is a huge loss, huge loss. Because the, in the end, the truth is, with all the success, whatever type that you might have in this dunya, in the end, it's, it's nothing. I mean, it, all of life, even if you live to over a hundred years, will seem like just a few days. And to the people of the hellfire, when they're asked, how long were you on earth? And these are the people who loved luxury the most and loved life the most, right? These people, it would seem to them like they lived part of a day. So that means you can have whatever you have of this dunya. And you know this hadith that describes really, really powerful. It describes that one of the most, the people of, the, of this earth that lived in the most luxury on the day of judgment, they'll bring a person from the people of earth who was the most luxurious. Who, who might that be? I know people always say, Bill Gates, no. <laughs> Bill Gates, you know, he grew up, you know, he w didn't grow up a millionaire and he suffered and then became rich and things like that. We're talking about someone who just woke up uh, with a silver spoon in his nostril, basically. All right. Who, so, someone that never dis had difficulty or anything like that. So, one of the person, people of, of earth who had the most luxurious and most easy and comfortable life. He'll be brought forth and dipped into the hellfire. One dip. One dip. You understand? Then he'll be asked, have you ever tasted luxury? Have you ever tasted comfort? And he'll say, never. What does that mean? That means the hellfire is so severe that he will forget every moment of luxury he ever experienced in his life. That's how severe the hellfire is. That's, he totally forgot. And they ask him, have you ever tasted luxury before? Ever? He says, no. Have you ever had comfort before? He cannot remember it because of one dip into the hellfire. So that means truly then, the ones who are really successful, in the end, they're the believers. It doesn't matter what you amass of the wealth and, and palaces and things and so forth of this life. But in the end, if you're not a believer, you have lost. You will not benefit whatsoever. 
and if just the idea of eternity in the hellfire will billah eternity in the hellfire will billah never ever coming out of it and you know the descriptions you know of the people who will be trying to climb out of the hellfire for 70 years they're climbing while they're in the fire and they're climbing over fire black fire not red like in the cartoons black fire they're crawling for 70 years trying to come out of the hellfire when they get to the top what happens to them an angel just flicks them back into to the bottom again and they start crawling again for 70 years people in the hellfire calling the, the keeper of the hellfire and his name is Malik right so they keep calling him and he ignores them how long does he ignore them they keep calling him Ya Malik Ya Malik Ya Malik Ya Malik Ya Malik and he just keeps ignoring them how long will they keep calling him a few hours Half an, half an hour? For 70 years, for 70 years they are calling him. Can you imagine that? For 70 years he's ignoring them. Ya Malik, Ya Malik, and he's just ignoring them. Then after 70 years he asked, this is what do you want? They said, just let your Lord kill us. Just kill us. Look at the, the dialogue of the people in the hellfire and look at their requests. Anyone have some time? Just go through the Quran, just look at the requests of the people in the hellfire. They never ever once request to be taken to paradise. True or false? Never. True or false? Why? Because they know they don't deserve it. They never say, oh Allah, take us to paradise. They either ask to be ex extinguished, okay, killed totally, non-existent, or they ask to be given another chance to go back to earth and get another try, get another shot at this. That's, but they never say, oh Allah, take us to paradise. Because they know they don't deserve it. They, they know that they don't deserve it. They don't enjoy being in the hell, but they know they don't deserve it. And that's why in the end of, uh, uh, the end of Surat, uh, the, uh, the crowds, the uh, uh, crowds, Zumar, the crowds. In the end of Surat Zumar, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَقِيلَ الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ And it was said, الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ All praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Now, waqila here means both groups said Alhamdulillah. Wait a minute, what both groups? The group of people in, in paradise, they said, khalas, after they entered paradise, they said Alhamdulillah, all praise is due to Allah, Lord of the worlds. But the people of the hellfire also said the same thing, isn't that strange? Why would the people in the hellfire say, all praise be to Allah, the Lord of the worlds? They're in the hellfire, <coughs> they don't enjoy that, they don't want to be there, but they're still saying Alhamdulillah, why? Because they realize that justice has been served. Justice has been served. Meaning, it's kind of, let's make the comparison. Someone in this life, and he's basically commits a murder or does some crime, and he pleads guilty. And the judge sentences him to whatever he sentences him. Now he says, that he, when the judge sentences him, he realizes in his heart that justice has been served. I do deserve this. Now is he happy to go to jail? No. But he, he knows that I do deserve this. Someone who did what I did shouldn't be set free. So I deserve this as much as I don't want to go to jail. I deserve it. So the people of the hellfire, they say, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, because they know they deserve to go to the hellfire. See, one of the things about the Day of Judgment is that it's very clear that on that day, it's black and white. Okay? In this life, people argue about things. And they commit a sin and they still argue. Maybe a guy chats with the, with the sisters too much and then... You tell him, brother, you're not supposed to do that. You know, there's a distance and a gap between men and women in Islam. He tells you, brother, what's wrong with you? The hearts are pure. And as long as the hearts are pure and there's nothing... You, you're you not sure of your heart? Because I'm sure of my heart. And nothing has happened. And see, arguments like this, on the Day of Judgment, that same guy, when he stands, he knows what he did wrong. There are no arguments for what well, the heart was pure. Or that. He knows it was wrong. Everyone knows what they did was right and what was wrong. So on the Day of Judgment then, people who disbelieved in Allah, they know that they're wrong. They, everything is clear at that moment. That this is Allah, those are His Prophets, this was right, that was wrong, and they know that they're wrong. That's it. There's no argumentation or anything like that. So, if we're talking about eternity in the hellfire, and, and, and then truly the success will be in being a believer in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in believing in Allah azza wa jal. Because eternity in the hellfire, that's really a loss. A believer, if you say, La ilaha illallah, yeah, I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah, and that Muhammad is his servant and his messenger, this will prohibit you or, or prevent you from spending all eternity in the hellfire. 
from spending all eternity in the hellfire. Which means then, even if you have amassed a huge amount of sins, until it expiates, the punishment will expiate your sins, you can come out of the hellfire. So the believer, even if they've committed so many sins, at the end they come out of the hellfire. But who, who remains in it forever? The ones who remain in it forever are the people who didn't believe in Allah Azza wa Jal. So we truly see what it means to be successful. If you're a believer, inshallah by some default, okay, now you don't want to bank on that one, right? But yeah, that's, you don't want that to be your plan, you know, well, in, in the end we all come out of the hellfire, so <laughs> I'll just spend my time there and pay my dues. No, that's not a good plan, is it? A very bad plan. But the believer is the only one who's really successful in that sense. So Allah Azza wa Jal began Surah Al-Mu'minun by saying, successful indeed are the believers. They're the ones who never spend eternity in the hellfire, right? And they're the ones who don't necessarily have to go into it, yeah? Unless, yeah, really, there's still a huge balance and it expiates their sins. So successful indeed are the believers. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the first description of the believers and that was that they are الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ those who are humbled or focused really in their prayers. So the, the prayer now isn't just mechanical actions, you know, up and down, up and down. But it's actually, it's supposed to be a time, this is the time when you're talking to Allah Azza wa You're speaking to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And so the value of your prayer, you know, comes in, into how much you focus in it. How much you're focusing in your salah. You know, what quality is this prayer? Is it just movements? Or is it a bit more than that? You're standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And everything has been facilitated for you to be able to focus in prayer. One of the things about khushu' I mean, when you focus in the salah, is that khushu' starts before the salah itself. So when, for example, the, the act of wudu, ablution, the act of wudu of washing, it's an act of worship in and of itself. And we perform it as an act of worship. It's preparation. It's preparing you for that prayer. Because... And I know of, uh, of people who, they were praying, the prayer had started and they're in a hurry to make wudu. So the guy, you know, washed his face, his arms and everything. Then, like, he, the prayer is kind of like progressing, yeah? So there was a bucket of water, so he just stuck his right foot in it, stuck his left foot and just ran. <laughs> so, he's in a hurry. No, wudu is an act of worship, you know, don't just rush it like that. It's about just getting wet, you know, pour a bucket of water on your head, run to the salah or something. It's an act of worship. So now it's preparing you. You're starting to get ready for what's going to happen. <coughs> for standing in front of Allah Azza wa Excuse me. So, focusing in the prayer starts way before the prayer. It starts as early as, uh, you know, when you hear the adhan, you repeat after the mu'adhan. So now you're getting into a different mode now. And making the wudu properly, it's an act of worship, using little water, rubbing the body parts, you know, doing it nice and slow. Um, some people, like their wudu is just, I don't know how they do it. I mean, we, should, we should videotape it, and probably with a high-speed camera, because I remember one time there was this brother, he said, I'll make wudu, I'll be back. And he goes like this and comes back, he's wet. I was like, well, what, what did you do? <laughs> he's like, what? <laughs> like, slow down with the wudu, you know. How did you get wet so quickly? What happened? Yeah, I mean, anyways, so it starts with that. Then before you start the prayer, you notice an Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would remove anything that would, have, that would cause him uh, to, to be distracted in the prayer. So for example, there is a curtain with a pattern on it or something in front of the Musalli, the person who's about to pray, you would remove it. Now, uh, this is kind of the opposite. Sometimes in our world now, we do the opposite, especially young people. Young brothers want to test their khushu' and want to test how much I can focus. So they'll pray and the TV's on in the other room and it's loud, you know. Like, let me see if I can do this thing. Allahu Akbar. Suddenly he's singing, you know, Teletubbies songs and stuff. <laughs> like, why did you do that? And all the, the radio's on and people are having a conversation. And he goes, let me see if I can do that. Allahu Akbar. Then he's just listening to them all the time. They're like, where was I again? Yeah. You don't test something that's important and you don't test anything that's dear to you. You know, your iman, your, your belief, your iman, and your belief in Allah is something that's dear to you. Do you test it? But many times people want to test themselves, especially young brothers, all right? I'm always going to pick on the young brothers tonight. Young brothers, they want to test their, their iman, they want to test things. Oh, yeah, I'll talk to this girl, yeah, she's attractive, but inshallah I can withstand. Why do you do that? You don't test anything that's dear to you, do you? Now, let's, uh, I think what's dear to people now, they're gadgets, yeah? So you don't test your... Uh, 
whatever it is, your iPad, iPod, laptop. You don't test that, you don't put it in the park bench and say, well, I'll come back tomorrow morning and see if it's still here. Because it's dear to you, yeah? Or maybe for some people, if that didn't resonate, your Xbox, your PS3 or 2 or whatever it is. You don't leave it somewhere and come back the next day. You also don't test your life because it's dear to you. You say, well, let me run across the highway, see if I can make it to the other side, see if my life will be there. You don't do that because it's something dear to you. So you don't test yourself. You don't test your iman. You don't test your khushu'a. Let me pray with the TV on. So you start to now remove obstacles, remove things that would disturb you during the prayer. And then you enter the salah. And you understand that you're standing in front of Allah Azza wa uh, One of the early Muslims, when he would make his wudu, his face would turn red. They would say, what's wrong with you? He would say, do you know who I'm going to stand in front of? I'm going to stand in front of Allah. But the difference is that he, he actually saw that he's going to stand in front of Allah. Well, most people are like, let me get duhr. Let me, let me knock this out of the way. Yeah? But he knows he's going to stand in front of Allah Azza wa Jal. And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells in the hadith that when you stand in prayer, okay, to pray to Allah Azza wa Jal, Allah Azza wa Jal, in His greatness, He turns to look at you. And that's incredible. If you could just remember that, how would your prayer be different? You just remember that Allah in His greatness is going to turn to look at you when you pray. Now, if you pray like that, would you be like focused on something else, the market, and when I get out of here, what I'm going to do, or when I call brother so and so? You're going to focus. Allah is turning to look at you now. But then the hadith says, and He doesn't turn away until you turn away, meaning you turn away with your heart or with your head. So, Allah Akbar, for the first few seconds, I'm really focused on Allah. And then in a minute, I'm like, oh, don't I need to go somewhere at, at 1 o'clock? Yes, I think the minute I get out of here, I'm going to call that brother immediately. <coughs> but I need to get a cab ride and. Uh oh. Khalas. You lost it. One time someone said, if you refocus, will Allah re look at you? I said, I don't know that. Who says yes? Who says no? We don't have any evidence. I don't know. You better do it right the first time, right? So now, you enter the salah. And you understand who you're standing in front of. You understand that Allah is going to turn towards you. And one of the, one of the ways to, 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 to really feel the salah, for example, to pray like it's your last prayer. Now, we, we all hear that. Sometimes the imam says, pray as if it's your last prayer. And you're like, sure. Allah yeah. Akbar. You forget. Oh, the brother is at 1 o'clock and 1.30. Yeah. Khalas, you forget immediately, right? But really, what if you really prayed as if it were your last prayer? And this is, I know this is a violent example, but I don't care. So... You're, you know, someone breaks into your house, and he's just a crazy guy. He says, I'm just going to shoot you in the head. Well, this is an American. You can see it's American, right? Shooting in the head. And <laughs> you guys don't have that, right? The guy, will, I, I, will, I will hit you with a stick, okay? <laughs> no guns in the UK. <laughs> so, the guy says, look, I'm going to shoot you in the head. I'll give you a moment to do whatever you want to do. You know, you can smoke your last cigarette or eat a steak. You're like, no, 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 I'd like to pray two rak'at. He's like, what's that? Like, prayer. Okay, I'll let you pray, but when the minute you say salam alaykum, salam alaykum, there's going to be a gun. The last thing you see is a flash and a barrel. I know that's very violent, but I purposely intend it to be violent. So you remember it. How will you pray that last prayer? Two rak'at. What do you think they will look like? Just like regular. Hurry up, hurry up. Or, oh, just get, Allahu Akbar. Your voice is going to be oh, beautiful. <laughs> it's going to be some superb, superb prayer. <laughs> and in the, in the ruku'ah, there's going to be some crying. There's going to be mentioning of certain sins. And you will ask Allah to forgive you for them. And you're going to mention your grave and death. You know, the soul departing your body being easy. And so on and so forth. I doubt it's going to be one of the regular just rush me through prayers, right? So that's, that's what it means. It's more dramatic. Pray as if it's your last prayer. So the next time you're in getting ready for the salah, the imam says, pray as if it's your last prayer. Just remember that guy with the gun. I'm going to shoot you in the head, man. <laughs> just imagine that. It's the, one of those things. What do you think? You think that might improve the salah a little bit? Absolutely, inshallah. Um, and of course, and no, we're not making this a lecture on... Um, 
you know, khushu' and salah. But we are mentioning those who are successful, the description they were believers. We, now we describe why the believers, and we understand why the believers are successful, and why it's the ultimate success, because in the next life you're okay, inshallah. Then we, dis we went, said that Allah, the first description of the believers is that they were humbled in their prayers. Not that they just performed the prayers up and down, up and down, but they were focused in it. It was a prayer of substance, of value. It was not just any movements. And that's why we got into like some of just a few of the things. Scholars have listed 30 some points that help you focus in your salah. But we're just mentioning just a few five or six points. And of course, one of the greatest things is to know what you're saying in prayer. To know what you're saying. So it's instead of it just being sentences in another language that I repeat every day and I don't know what it's saying, like find out what you're saying in the salah. Find out the, the, the everyone has you know surah that they constantly recite in the prayer. Find out what they're saying, what they mean. Okay, so now as you say it now, you can understand, you can focus on the meaning. Likewise, what what, do we, what does Allahu Akbar mean? You know, Sami Allahu Subhan Subhan Rabbil A'la Subhan Rabbil Azim. What do all these things mean? And when you understand them, then it helps you and focus on what you're saying. Not only that, you know there are different variations of what to say. You know, in sujood there are a number of ad'a you can say coming up from, you know, in prostration. Oh, every any different movement, there are more, is more than one dua you can say or supplicate. So f learn the different ones. Why? When you learn the different ones, it doesn't become a routine thing that you just go over. Like dua al-istiftah for example, the different prayers after the takbir, different prayers that you can say. So uh, learn all of them and learn different ones and then alternate. The scholars say when you alternate, you know, different variations of the ad'iyah during salah, it prevents your prayer from being something routine that you just do without thinking. It's like when you drive to work, drive back, drive to work, drive back. But if you, one day you're driving to work and you change, take a different route, you know, between homes and neighborhoods, you really have to focus now because you don't want to get lost. And in your mind you're imagining the main road still over there, so I kind of have to keep going in this direction. It's very different. I don't think anyone takes a new shortcut to work and he's just like, you know, the regular route, not paying attention. They pay attention. So the same thing happens, same phenomenon. So Allah Azza wa describes that the people who are truly successful, they are the believers. The first description of the believers, excuse me, <coughs> is that they are, uh, that they are humbled and they are focused in their prayers. And then this, another description, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّغْوِ مُعْرِضُونَ And those who avoid vain talk. Those who avoid vain talk. Now, um, there's, like, there's the general vain talk, and then within that generalization, there's some severe and specific things that you always make sure you want to stay away from. And we said that the tongue, the thing about the tongue, okay, the, the source of all the vain talk and all the problems, it's uh, a small instrument that's very dangerous. Okay? Why is it a dangerous instrument, the tongue? Because one, few people know how to control it, or few people can control it, and the second thing is that it never tires. That's what I call a recipe for disaster. It's a small, it's a muscle that never tires. Never tires? Okay, you know, every muscle gets tired, right? St you know, strongest muscle in the upper body, the lats, right? The lats get the strongest muscle in the upper body, but they get tired. Strongest muscle in the lower body, your thighs, thigh muscles. They're a combination of muscles, but they're the strongest, they're very, very powerful. You know, lower back muscles also, extremely, extremely powerful, but they tire. Then you've got your tongue. And you can keep talking for hours and hours and hours. Right, sisters? <laughs> I'm just asking the sisters just to see if they're paying attention. Not for any other reason. Okay, no, for, there was another reason. But you can keep talking for hours and hours and hours and just not get tired. I mean, sometimes your jaw gets tired, right? You, you, you know, you're chewing a lot, big steak, and you're just chewing and chewing and chewing. You get tired, your jaws are hurting you, like I need a break, but I'm still not hungry though. I'm still hungry, I need, but I need a break. My jaws are tired, right? But you talk, 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 and you never feel fatigue in your tongue. Everyone ever experience fatigue in their tongue? Your tongue never gets tired. So this is the problem. It's a small little dangerous instrument that never tires. It can keep going for hours and hours and hours. Okay? You'll get tired, your throat will get dry, your mouth will get dry, and you just take some water and you can keep going. Your tongue never gets tired. So it's a recipe for disaster. It doesn't get tired and few people can control it. But this is a problem. And then on top of that, we have angels that will record what you say in this life. What you say is recorded. Good things are recorded, bad things are recorded. 
and people are just letting this tongue loose and you just lash out at everybody with it and then there are certain things like there's regular vain talk you know talking about useless things and um, just regular things that are, are of no specific benefit but it's still permissible to talk about them yeah like for example like soccer or, or football it's permissible to talk about uh, football isn't it <coughs> okay yeah it is right you can talk about whatever Chelsea and uh, Real Madrid and fake Madrid and and uh, whatever what's the other one Manchester United right uh, just the other day I finally understood who this Messi guy is and like I always see a t-shirt that says Messi now I want to make a t-shirt that says neat you know <laughs> clean now I discover this Messi guy is some player and stuff okay so it's permissible to talk about all that isn't it so but you know okay but it gets more dangerous then when we get into areas of backbiting spreading rumors and tales and causing problems amongst people and using profanity and lying then we start to see because here Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu the companion he asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam this is really a brilliant question one of the greatest things about the companions is they really asked phenomenal questions that would help us benefit and they asked these great questions because they were great people so he came and he asked the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam what of the things most lead people into the hellfire? Okay. Or actually he asked about paradise first. What of the things will most take people into paradise? And the Prophet ﷺ said, Taqwa Allah wa husnul khuluq. Have being God conscious, meaning you have piety, you're pious, you're God conscious. Which is very important. And, and mostly now in this world that we live in now. There has never ever been a time when sinning was so available to people, true or false. It's so available. Sins are so available. I mean, you don't have to suffer to find alcohol. I mean, you can walk out of here and in five minutes, I'm sure you can be in a store and you can consume alcohol, true or false. There's just any sin you mention. And you don't even have to leave your home for some sins. Within seconds, you can be looking at something that's haram, that's not permissible. There's never ever been a point in history where you had to police yourself. No one can police you. There's no one that's around you unless you... You have a Siamese twin, you're like, like uh, 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 uh. <laughs> Otherwise, like, who's going to police you all the time? So that's why piety is such a fantastic thing. You're aware that Allah is watching you all the time. You don't mess up. You're aware that Allah is watching you. Most people, as we said, their main concern now, are there, enough, are there cameras that are watching me? Is there a police officer? Is there a security guard? Is there a human being that can see me? So you lock doors, you close windows, turn off some lights. And you think, that's it, I'm good. But Allah can see you. So piety is fantastic. Number one, piety. The second thing, and Nabi Wasallam said, husn al-khuluq, good manners. Good manners. Now, does good manners involve the tongue? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, good speech, good words, kind words, not saying bad words, all this part of good manners. So we start to see now the tongue, it's one of the top two things that can help you go into paradise. Then, and this is what's so great about the companions, they asked, he asked Abu Hurairah asked, what are the two things that most take people into the hellfire? What are the two things that most take people into the hellfire? And Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam responded, Al-Famu wal-Farj, that the mouth, meaning the tongue speaking, and the sexual organs. These are two things, what's going on here? Two things that but, but, <laughs> most lead people into the hellfire. The mouth and the sexual organs. What do you think the mouth is? Yani? Rub a bank with your mouth. Excellent. With your mouth, what happens? Bad words, bad manners, backbiting, spreading rumors, tales, causing problems between people. All these caused by the mouth. So we start to see how dangerous this is. One of the top two things that leads people into the hellfire. It's time to stop. Oh, wow. So, this might be too much even, yeah? So, okay, so we're saying that, and that that's really, you know, so it, it shows again how serious this is. So, can we control our tongues? The good news, of course, yes, you can. Allah never ever commands you to do something or asks you to do something that you can't do in the Quran. Never ever. Everything that he'll ask you to do, and everything that's praised, it's something that's attainable, something that you can do. If you, and you remove obstacles and you put your mind to it, you can do it. So controlling the tongue, is it possible to do that? Absolutely, it's possible to do that. Lying, is it possible to not lie? 
Yeah, it's possible to not lie. The problem is people are just so used to lying now. Adults, it is said, this is a, these statistics are American, and I'm sure you, you know yours will probably be less. Whatever. That uh, people lie, the <laughs> adults lie on average two to three times a day. Two to three times a day. And children r lie from five to six times a day. Here's the problem. We actually teach our children, and <laughs> father's looking at his son. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, we teach our children to lie. Absolutely, we encourage them to lie. How so? When they speak the truth, we punish them. Who broke this? I did. <laughs> I punished him for speaking the truth. And if he lies, who broke this? Uh, the cat. <laughs> oh, really? Well, we should put some poison out for that thing. And you walk away. So the child learns that if you lie, you get away with it. If you speak the truth, you get five fingers across the face. <laughs> So then they start to lie. They start to learn to lie. So how about this for parents in the room? If your child tells the truth, don't punish them. And if they lie, then you punish them. Yeah? So I always do that. I tell my son, you know, did you do it? If you lie, you're, not, you're never going to get in trouble. As much as I want to strangle the life out of you right now. But if you, if you tell the truth, nothing will happen to you because you spoke the truth. And he'll just say the truth and say, you can go. Then my wife will hold me back because I want to kill him as he's walking away. But it's okay. <laughs> so, the tongue. Do we have to lie? Let me ask you this. How many times in your life have you had to lie to save your life? I mean, don't put your hand up, Yanni. No. Unless you're in a gang, like, on a daily basis. For three times a week I have to uh, lie to save my life. <laughs> Now, but realistically, I think for the most part, most people in the audience, they've probably never had to lie to save their life, right? And if you really had to lie to save your life, then in Islam that would be acceptable. I don't think anyone would blame you. I don't think your imam will be like, you should have told the truth. He would have killed you, but uh, you should no, no one will ever tell you that, right? But, so the, the truth is then, if, if we don't really need to lie to live, why do we have to lie? So, is it difficult to say, I am never ever going to lie until I go to my grave. Is that hard to say? No, it's not. Wallahi, it's not. Wallahi, it's not. You can say, I'm never ever going to tell. I don't care who it is. I'm not afraid of anybody. And what's the worst that they could do to me? Yani, what is, okay, look, you live here in the UK. It's a civilized society for the most part, or what it appears to be, right? It's a civilized society. Like, what will they do to you if you speak the truth? What's the worst that could happen to you in the UK if you speak the truth? What's the most pr trouble you could get into? Yeah. Yeah. J what do you guys do? Jail? Why? No, I, mean, I mean like, I mean, you're just a normal guy who goes to work, comes home and prays and stuff. It's not like you've got cocaine in the bag and the officer says, what's in the bag? You're like, um, all-purpose white flour. <laughs> <laughs> so I, like, I mean, in the, your normal course of your normal life, what's the worst that can happen to you? Like, right? What, get fired from work? Yeah, I mean, okay, I'll go work somewhere else. Yeah. Yes, it's not fun looking for work, but is, is it that bad? Is it the end of the world? And is it, is, what I'm saying is, is it impossible to say that I'm never ever going to lie again until I go to my grave? Is it impossible to say that? Well, I don't think it's that hard. How many people now, don't put your hand up, but just answer yourself to yourself because that's what it's about. How many people can do that right now? Say to yourself, you know what? I'm never ever going to lie again. What's the worst anyone can do to me? And I'm not involved in anything, any drugs or conspiracies. So what's the worst that could happen in my normal day-to-day -day routine? I'm never ever going to tell a lie. Because the hadith says, the Nabi sallallahu says, that a man will continue to lie until he be written with Allah as a liar. A man will continue to tell lies until he is written with Allah as a liar. Some of us in here are in our 20s, some are in our 30s, 40s, 50s. Okay, how many lies have we told? And what if because of all these lies that we continued to tell, we are actually sitting right now and we're labeled with Allah as a liar. Imagine that. Imagine that. If you've lied a lot, the hadith says you continue to lie and you're labeled with Allah as a liar. So when Allah looks at you, He doesn't see Hassan or Abdurrahman or Muhammad or Ali, He just sees Liar. So liar, then truthful person, truthful liar, truthful liar, liar, liar over there, sisters, liar, 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 liar. That's how Allah labeled you? 
Who in here accepts that for themselves? Who in here absolutely would hate that, to be labeled a liar? They walk into the store, liar. They're buying apples, liar. They get some water, liar. Walk into the masjid, liar. Coming out of the masjid, liar labels just on top of you. Now don't you hate that? What we just described, wouldn't you absolutely hate that? To be labeled a liar with Allah? So now one more time. Who in here, without putting your hands up, can just right now in your chair say to yourself, I'm never, ever, ever going to tell a lie until I go to my grave. What are they going to do to me? And who is this that's going to do something to me? What are they going to like, get out an Iron Maiden and stretch me out and tie me up between two trucks and put H1 drive in a different direction? What's going to happen? And I know you've got, you had some, you know, some severe torture methods in, in the good old days in, the, <laughs> in England, but I don't think any of those exist anymore, do they? So what are they going to do to you? All right. I want to talk. I want to conclude by talking about uh, a last group, and uh, as uh, our young brother recited in the beginning, uh, another group of people that are successful or are doing something great, and that's one of the reasons why I'm in um, jolly old England at the moment, right? You guys are so serious, mashallah. How about I tell you a joke? What's the greatest thing that ever happened between the UK and North America? The Atlantic Ocean. <laughs> oh boy, that was that was more on the. Yeah, yeah. This is what we're going to discuss in our course, you know, in this weekend. We're going to talk about ethnocentricity because you know what? I'll tell you the truth. Standing here as an American, I believe that American culture is superior to British culture. And then you guys are sitting here, these these bloody yanks, you know. You're you're sitting here, and you're certain that your culture is superior to my culture. True or false? Let's be honest, true, right? But the truth is, it's a tie. We both lose. Okay, <laughs> so who are, what's another group of great people? And what brought me here, we're teaching a course with Al-Maghrib. Uh, the course that I'm teaching is called Shahada, Fiqh of Da'wah. And it's about how to give Da'wah to people, to Muslims and to non-Muslims, to Christians, to Jews, to Zoroastrians, to Magians, to Buddhists, to whoever it is. And, and the verse that was recited in the beginning of this event was, وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا so who is better in speech? It, it looks like a question, but it's a rhetorical question. Allah is telling you, nobody is better in speech than the one who calls to Allah. But notice again, وَعَمِلَ صَالِحًا So the believers, successful, and they pray. They're not just believers. Oh, I believe in Allah. But I don't pray, but I, I have faith, brother. I have faith. No, no, no. You have, if you believe, there has to be you have, your body, your, your limbs, have to act accordingly. You cannot say, none has a right to be worshipped except Allah. And then, you don't worship Allah. That doesn't make any sense. Your actions have to go in line with your beliefs. If I tell someone, hey, this is poison, don't drink it. If I drink it, that means it's probably not poison. Your actions have to go in line with your beliefs. So the believers in this verse, that we're looking at, they believed and they prayed. They did something. Here, who is better in, in speech than the one who calls to Allah? And he also does the righteous deeds. So there's always the action involved, always. So Allah is saying no one is better in speech than the one who calls other people to Allah. Meaning call non-Muslims to Allah, call Muslims back to Allah Azza wa Jal. No one is better in speech. And these, this is also a great description of, of people who will be successful inshallah. So um, who, who has not heard of Al-Maghrib Institute? Put your hands up. Oh wow, three people? So everyone else has heard of Al-Maghrib Institute? Okay, that's good, that's good. Uh, well, Al-Maghrib is coming, so the fourth guy. Al-Maghrib is coming to, uh, <coughs> to your city. And uh, the way it works is they offer uh, degrees in Islamic studies. You don't have to travel. The, the, the speaker, the sheikh, the instructor will come to your city. And it's an intensive course. It will be two full days, Saturday, Sunday. Then there's a gap, obviously, the week in the middle. Then next weekend, we reconvene again, Saturday, Sunday, all day, or like from 10 to around Maghrib time. And you cut a variety of different subjects in full detail, made relevant to you with PowerPoints, with explanations, with a speaker that speaks your language. It's just, and it, there has never been a time in, in, in our history when it was so easy, especially for the non-Arabic speaking Muslim, to learn their religion properly. Wallahi, what a blessing it is. Really, there's never been a time like this before. So a sheikh will come to your city and give you tafsir. And I think there's a card on every chair of uh, the, the first course. This will be the first course ever, right? And you will see how amazing these courses. There'll be, you know, 
sometimes a hundred, sometimes two, three hundred, sometimes five hundred people sitting, all of them learning tafsir, Quranic exegesis, or the meaning of the Quran, or learning some intricate, you know, science of hadith or something like that, or learning fiqh of da'wah, or learning something about the seerah of the Prophet in such detail, in your language, in terms with analogies that are simple and, and good to, and, and make it nice and easy to understand, it's just such an opportunity. You get notes, you get everything, then you can take the exam three weeks later and then it moves, to the, the grade goes towards your Islamic degree. It's never been like this. Who has, he, who has attended the Al-Maghrib course? Put your hands up. Okay? So those of you who have not attended, look around, see who's got their hands up, talk to these people, say, how are these courses? Alright? But here's the problem though. So this is great work. Alright? And I'll tell you how great this work is. You, know, you guys know who is the founder of Al-Maghrib Institute? <coughs> His name is Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif, right? And one of the brothers, when I was in Canada, he was the Amir of one of the Qabail, the, the tribes, right? He said one day, Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif came to visit us, and he said something that at the moment when I heard it, I said to myself, that's, that's a little arrogant. He said, Sheikh Muhammad al-Sharif came up to, and he's speaking to all the volunteers of Al-Maghrib. He says, I know you want me to stand here and say, Jazakum Allah khair, and thank you guys for all the great work that you do and working for Allah. He said, but it's not like that. He said, you guys should be thanking me. He said, I thought to myself, that's arrogant. Or why should we thank you? This, we should all say yes. Thank the people for their hard work. He said, then when we started and we had a couple of courses, I understood what he meant. He said, I looked at the room, there were 250, 300 people, all of them sitting and taking notes and learning something about the religion of Allah Azza wa Jal. And I was a part of that group being there. He said he was right. He said, I wanted to go and thank him. Say, thank you for allowing me to be part of this. To, to have the reward in this. 300 people learning their religion. You know, well, well, thousands and millions are just wasting their life and you know, going to watching football matches. I'm just joking. Right? So, but the, this is the sad part though. How many volunteers does uh, Nottingham Al Maghrib have currently? How many? Three brothers and a million sisters. A million, is that what you said? Yeah. So you don't need any more sister volunteers? <coughs> Say? 100? 100? 100. Okay. So that's about 97 people. Well, 100 is 97 people. 100 is 100. You said 100, so that's 97. <coughs> so, <coughs> uh, now, let me take a wild guess here. Do you need more volunteers? <laughs> Come on, what's wrong with you guys? You're lazy, three men, you can't handle like a huge event with a couple of hundred people? Probably not, right? So, so we need volunteers. This is work for Allah, this is what it's about. And someone's rolling up their sleeve, getting up, saying, you know what, I'm going to be part of this, I'm going to make it happen. This is, this is what it is. And we all expect the religion to move forward, but in order for the religion to move forward, we got to get up and we have to roll our sleeves. So, I'm not going to embarrass and say, put your hand up if you want to volunteer, or, unless you want me to do that, do you? Fantastic. You see, he's a British gentleman. Could you stand up, please? Thank you very much. That handsome man right there, if you want to volunteer. <laughs> okay, are you single? Okay, I have a seat. Because I was going to promote you and put your phone number up. But, <laughs> or if you're married, you're going to get beaten tonight for sure. I hope you're not. <laughs> so that's the man you go to if you want to volunteer. Yeah? You want to help out, do something fantastic, inshallah. And some people, wallahi, some of the Maghrib students have taken a lot of courses. They are very knowledgeable, mashallah. I've met some of those guys there, heavy hitters, you know. So, maybe you'll volunteer and you'll become a heavy hitter. Or maybe you'll volunteer and you won't become a heavy hitter, but other people will become, and you'll look back and, let you and say, you know what, look at this man, mashallah, giving lectures and things. And he was part of Al-Maghrib and I was part of bringing him in. Wow, free reward for you. Free reward. Anyways, I think I'll conclude here. Zatun um, khairan for your attentive listening. And I think we might do some Q&A in a little bit. So, sallallahu wa baraka ala Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, we would like to now give you guys the opportunity to ask the Sheikh any question you have. Um, it could be related to the talk, it could also be related to Dawah, because obviously that's where he mainly specializes in. So if you have any questions, inshallah, please just raise your hand um, and just ask the questions. Please just stick to questions instead of long comments.
de Jean Plocher. Are you sure it's one or is it a hundred questions? <laughs> okay, go for it. <coughs> Were you serious? We're waiting for the question. What's that? Where's your question? Okay, I'm just going to encourage your mommy to smack you tonight, okay? <laughs> Hold on. Me personally, or mean someone? You mean you, as in hypothetically you? Uh, I haven't actually. Uh, none? Oh, okay, and what are you looking for exactly? Let me just help you that way. Oh, you're gonna talk. Oh, you're gonna talk to a Jew soon. Okay, okay, very good. Uh, basically. Um, you know, we have the Tawheed, or let me just give you instructions, it's better than telling you my story. Because mine were a little weird. But, uh, basically you've got the Tawheed thing down, right? They worship one God for the most part. And uh, your, your main focal point will be on the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because uh, for, the, for the Jew, they're kind of in a strange predicament because two great men came and they refused to follow them. I mean, Isa Alayhi Salaam, Jesus came. He was a great man and a great prophet, and they totally refused to follow him in his time. Then another great man came, and he had all he had all the descriptions that they were looking for, and they also refused to follow him. So your your point with them will be that they need to follow Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and everything about his life, his sayings, his teachings, his conduct indicates that he was a genuine prophet. Um, so, so explore it through that. Like, there are always two possibilities. Either he was a genuine prophet or he wasn't. If he wasn't a genuine prophet, it would be clear from his teachings, his life, his sayings, his actions. And if he was a genuine prophet, it would also be clear. So try to explore that. And if you need more, um, there's a video on YouTube called Dawah Techniques that specifically analyzes Muhammad Wasallam to prove if he's a genuine prophet or not. Okay? Allah Ta'ala A'la. Next. Yes. Uh, I'm in the uh, we are Muslims here and we live among non-Muslims. And uh, you spoke about Dawah and uh, in the air you recited you know, the people of the good and the people of the Dawah. Uh, here in England, I mean, our neighbours are non Muslims, see. And uh, the culture here is probably different to America, where your neighbour never talks to you about politics or religion. Mm. You see, and uh, there, you know, people are shy in that sense. Yes. To, to open their house to you about the religion, to say to you whether they believe or not, and uh, and I personally feel the same. I feel, you know, too too shy to to approach them. You know, they're great neighbours on either side. So right. They're non-Muslims. They see us as Muslims. Right. And, you know, they see my family as Muslims because we, we wear the uh, you know the the etiquette. So uh, I'd like some advice, you know, how to go to my neighbor John, you know, and uh, have the strength and the courage okay. to say to him, you know, Phenomenal. to save you. Excellent. I love your question. And I love uh, the, uh, the, the introvertedness and the, the good manners of the British people. That's, uh, that's great. And, and it's true that, uh, like, even, even in America, you, you might... You, you feel that, what if I speak to my neighbor, and now our relationship becomes awkward, right? Because, oh, he tried to convert me, and now it's very awkward. Like in the morning, oh, good morning, good morning. It's a strange relationship. And so, and, and sometimes beyond that, just, I'm shy. I'm a shy individual, and I don't know how to just to knock, into, knock on someone's door and say, hey, I want to talk to you about my religion, and hopefully convince you to follow it too, right? But here's the, here's the thing. You said you had great neighbors. You had good neighbors, right? And, 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 I, and I always yeah, and I use the same analogy, but if you're going to work one morning and you see your neighbor, he just runs out of his house and he's on fire. Okay? He's on fire and he runs out of his house screaming. And you're backing your car out, you're about to go to work, you know. What will you do? You just offer some, some you know, candid, stoic piece of advice like, uh, Hey, 
uh, stop, drop, and roll, huh? And then you drive off, you're in a hurry, or you throw him your bottle of water, like, hey, it's the last, but use it wisely, huh? And then you drive off. You would actually, you know, your face would change. There would be a look of worry, and your eyes would open wide, and you would run, and you would take off your jacket, and you would try to put the fire out. And in the process, you might get burnt yourself. You get some second degree burns, or something. you get injured trying to put the fire out because you care for this individual. Even if you did not like him, you would try to put the fire out. I doubt that you're, you don't look like the type of man that would drive off. I don't think anyone can do that. What if I can use that and, and make that the driving force? And that will be the driving force that will even push aside my, my shyness and guilt and all that stuff. Look, I really care for them. They're really good people, but they really don't know about Islam. Many people, and this is what's happening, people around you, they don't know what Islam is or they just heard some website or read on some website what Islam isn't or heard on the news what Islam isn't. So if they only knew what it was and if you really care for them, you want them to know. And I'll conclude by saying the Prophet Sallam, that's the reason when he was offered to crush the people of Mecca between the two mountains, he refused because he cared. All the superb du'at, they cared so much. Um, so that's it. Just use your, how much you care for them and what good people they are and what they don't know about Islam to say, look, even if it, and inshallah it won't become awkward. And that's the last thing I'll close with, is that a lot of times we assume that the relationship will become awkward. We assume they won't accept it. But you just walk in and say, look, we've been neighbors for seven years. I think you know that, I've, uh, that I'm Muslim from how I dress, my wife dresses and so on and so forth. And you know, I just wanted to let you know what I believe. I just wanted to share it with you. That's it. That's simple. I see some hands up and I'm um, told to, to do these. Sisters, Your sisters, okay, we'll give them a chance and we'll come to you. These are the sisters. These are the sisters, yeah. These are the last two questions. Okay. Oh, these are, okay. These are the last two as well. Yeah. Uh, if you have elderly parents who are Christians and they say they're too old to change, how do you give them da'wah? Jazakallah khair. Um, basically, I mean, it's, it's not a valid argument, yeah? I mean, basically, you just have to keep convincing them. There's no such thing as, as too old to change. You can give them examples of... Uh, the father of Abu Bakr and when he came to the Prophet and he changed his religion and he was entirely white, his beard was all white, his hair was all white. He was such an old man that the Prophet felt bad that he came to me. I should have gone to him. So, and, and give him examples of people. I, I know of a man, we did the da'wah training in New Jersey and Sunday we went out for street da'wah. And the brothers, they saw this man, he was 81 years old, coming out of church, it was Sunday, on the footsteps of the church. And this was like, you know, these Baptist churches. So you know he was twirling and dancing just a few minutes ago. They had this huge uh, rush. Uh, and they were just all yelling and excited. On the steps of the church, they gave him shahada. He became Muslim. And it turns out that he lives across the street from the Musalla. Two years later, I get an update from him. He's still praying at the Musalla. 81 years old. So there is no such thing to say at, the, you know, at this age or that age. So just convince them that this is not a valid argument. The second question says, how would you give da'wah to someone who says he has no need to have faith or anything, let alone Allah plus Islam? Look, anytime someone says, I don't need religion, I don't need Islam, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, uh, they're, they're saying this based on ignorance. So you have to explain to them, yes, you do need. Maybe this person doesn't know about, the, about paradise and the hellfire. Maybe this person doesn't know that the hellfire is black that people stay in it for all eternity. If he understands that, he will see the need immediately. Maybe you can sometimes, and we've done this before, you can guilt someone. Okay, who gives you everything that you have? Allah gives you everything that you have, and your health, your intelligence, things you can't put a price on. And you're telling me, I don't have time, and I'm not, I don't need to worship it, I don't need to thank him, and so on and so forth. So there are many different ways through which you can tackle this individual. Okay, khair uh, inshallah. Uh, there are many different ways you can tackle this individual, but the, for the most part, they say they don't need because they don't have knowledge and they don't know what they're up against. So show them the importance and the seriousness of the situation. And I was told that this is the final question. I take it up with him, yeah? It says, how should women give da'wah? How should women give da'wah? And now I... I will assume now, I'll be biased here, and I'll assume that there is a lot of cultural stuff involved in this question, because I mean, what's, you know, is there anything about women that, like they, I mean, there are many ways you can give da'wah, so what's the problem? I mean, you can 
talk to women about Islam, you can talk to your neighbors about Islam, co-workers, you can talk if you're in, in the university, talk to people in, at the university about Islam. If there happens to be a da'wah table at, the, at your university, you can stand at your da'wah table. If there's a da'wah organization where you know, groups go out in the street, you can go with the group. You, know, it can be, you can have a partner who's a female and go out and speak to people. And what if you're in the middle of nowhere, and you know, not the middle of nowhere, let's say you're in the middle of a mall, and a man comes up to you and says, why do you women wear that? That's a da'wah opportunity. Can you talk to him? Um, I don't know why you're hesitating. Yes. Scholars say as long as the conversation doesn't leave outside the realm of da'wah. Once we get into, hey, giggle, giggle, I like the color of your hijab, then it's over. But as long as it, it didn't get into that, fine, what's the problem? Yeah? So there's so many da'wah opportunities for you. You can just deal with, uh, you can just, you know, pen pals, women in prison, for example. You can even go overseas. I mean, talk to women, in, many women in America, they just want someone to talk to. And I'm talking to women now, okay? Not to brothers and get excited and get sweet and stuff. So sisters, pen pals, you know, women here in jail, so there's so much you can do, so why the question? I know why the question, because probably someone told you, don't talk, your voice is aura. And we can respect that opinion, but we, we need evidence to say that, you know, you can't speak and, and you have to, you know, basically gag yourself and don't speak and anything. So there's, there are opportunities for you, just to, there are for men, just don't make the adhan and don't give any jum'ah khutab, I think you'll be alright. That's it. And the opportunities are available for both. There are some guidelines. Stay within the guidelines. You'll be okay, inshallah. Azawajal, wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Zakumullah khairan for your attentive listening and for slightly chuckling at my jokes. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.